All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Denzel Washington. I'm the Director of Education for the Theta Iota Lambda Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Can everyone hear me in here? Our microphone is not cooperating with us today. Can you hear me in the back? Perfect. Brother Lee, can you hear me? Higher? Higher? OK. All right. My name is Denzel Washington. I am the Director of Education for the Theta Iota Lambda Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Welcome to the 13th annual Senator Edward W. Brook III Oratorical Scholarship Competition. Today, our contestants will be answering the question, with liberty and justice for all, how have Supreme Court decisions over the past decade impacted communities of color? Thank you to the brothers of the chapter, the Lee B. Revels Scholarship Mentoring Foundation, the committee, and the community for assisting and making today possible. I have to say, we have a powerhouse of judges today. This makes me very happy. Thank you all for being here today. I want to give a special thank you to Brother Calvin Hill and to Springfield College for allowing us the space to compete today. I want to give a special thank you to the Urban League of Springfield for giving us the space to prepare for today's competition as well. But before we begin, it must be something about preparing for the oratorical competition because there was a group of brothers that decided that we must have needed the extra help in making sure today happened. So before we start, I would like to congratulate our newest initiates of the Theta Iota Lambda chapter. So Brother Gasan Sanchez. <laughs> Brother David Halbert. <laughs> and unfortunately, Brother Ed Johnson could not make it today. Thank you, brothers. Today, you will hear from five gentlemen who have worked completely hard over the last couple of weeks preparing for today. Gentlemen, I am so proud of you all, especially proud of you, Mike. <laughs> they've, been to multiple, they've been to multiple workshops. They've done policy research and public speaking. They've done reshaping the mind. What does leadership look like? They've also been to an Alpha Esquire event in Boston for a leadership conference. The Bible says, if you raise a child the correct way, when they get older, they won't depart. So gentlemen, you know the way to go. Thank you to Brother Zephyrin. Thank you to Attorney Del Marina Lopez. And thank you to Bro Ramos and to the chapter for assisting in making today possible as well. With that, I would like to introduce our MCs for today. First, I will start with Bro Henry Austin. Henry was born and raised in Springfield, Massachusetts, and he is a graduate from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, where he became a fall 11 initiate of the new chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He also received his MBA from the University of Louisville. As Bro Austin is an aspiring data scientist, he is a current candidate to receive his master's in applied data science from Bay Path University. Lastly, he's one of my best friends. Professor Stephen Bradley, Bro Bradley as we know him, is a life member, 10,552 to be exact, and he is celebrating his 25th year in the House of Alpha. Originally from Yakima, Washington, Bro Bradley received his PhD in 20th century US history with an emphasis on the black experience from University of Missouri, Columbia. He is a Charles Hamilton Houston professor of Black Studies and History at Amherst College and the author of two award-winning books, The Upending Ivory Tower, Civil Rights, Black Power, and the Ivy League, along with Harlem versus Columbia University, Black Student Power in the late 1960s. He is also the co-editor of the book, Alpha Phi Alpha, A Legacy of Greatness, The, the Demands of Transcendence. Bro Bradley is the recipient of numerous honors and awards for his scholarship, teaching, leadership, and service. As a scholar grounded in community work, Bradley is respected, and he is a voice and a thought leader in the African-American history and modern-day American race relations. He has appeared in New York Times, Washington Post, MSBC, 
CNN, BCC, Al Jazeera, BET, the Oprah Winfrey Network, and the History Channel, amongst and many more. What haven't you done, brother? <laughs> Needless to say, this brother has done it all. But before our MCs come up, please help me welcome Brother Marcus McCullough as he leads the way and has invocation for us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Join me for a moment of prayer. Great God and source of all life, how we give thanks for this moment this afternoon. We are thankful for all of the study and all of the preparation. We're thankful for this opportunity for these young men to exhibit their gifts, their talents, and their skills. We ask your great blessing upon this moment, upon this event, upon this community, upon this fraternity, and upon this chapter. May this be a moment of transformation, a moment of sharing, and a moment that we can all be proud of. We give thanks, and together with joy we say, Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We are pleased as pie and proud as peacocks to be here with you today. Uh, we're so, so very proud of these young men and uh, what they're about to deliver to you uh, today. I'd like to introduce, my name is Stephen Bradley, uh, and I'd like to introduce Brother Henry. My name's Brother Henry Austin. Yes. And so we'll be emceeing uh, today, and we're going to do it Run DMC style. Uh, and so we're very, very happy to be here with you today. Uh, we all know that we're here for a particular reason, uh, but we want to offer respect to all of the, the dignitaries and uh, very special people. Uh, by dignitaries, I mean the students uh, that we'll hear from. By servants of mankind, I mean the wonderful people in the second row here uh, who have done great things to help the people. Uh, and we're so grateful for you being here today. Um, what we'll do uh, is we'll take a little time to introduce the, the judges, and then we'll talk about uh, the, the rules of the contest and, and, and put, place the contest in context. So uh, uh, I'll go ahead and start by introducing uh, none other than our own Brooks Fitch, who is the president of Paragon Legacies. Uh, and uh, Brother Fitch, uh, and, and I say that my black brother Fitch, he happens to be a member of uh, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated and uh, a member of uh, Sigma Pi Phi uh, Boule. Uh, he has uh, led, and this is, this is most important to me as an historian, he has uh, led the Freedmen's Memorial Initiative that brought together all sorts of corp cor uh, corporations uh, in Texas and throughout the nation to create a world-class memorial of 7,000 African-American freedmen enslaved. This is so important. Round of applause for Brother Bruce. And next for our judges, we have uh, Senator Adam Gomez, uh, the first Latino from the Hampton District to serve in the Massachusetts Senate. Um, big ups to you, brother, for that. Um, his personal beliefs and experience have driven his years of advocacy work for uh, social justice issues, such as criminal justice reform, um, immigrant rights, education issues, as well as civil rights. So thank you for joining us today as a judge, brother. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd introduce you to uh, Josiah Gonzalez, uh, and he serves uh, as a very principled leader. Uh, he is uh, the Chief Philanthropy and Communications Officer at Home City Development, which is a nonprofit uh, uh, community development corporation focused on uh, what's so desperately needed in the area, and that is housing. Uh, 
uh, and he is also vice chair of the Springfield uh, School Committee. So thank you so kindly. And this next judge is very special and close to me myself. Uh, it is Kimothy Jones. Uh, she is the Program Director of Community Health, planning in the Office of Diversity, Equity, as well as Inclusion, as well as the Office of Public Health. Uh, she collaborates with multidisciplinary teams and community partners to help curate health education programming here in the city of Springfield to inform the broader community um, about prevention, early screening and detection, and the treatment of chronic diseases. Uh, my mother, Kimothy Jones. That's very special. That's, um, I'd like to introduce now uh, Joe Page, who is a, a resident of Springfield, Massachusetts, and an educator. Uh, he had received his, his uh, education from American International College and the University of Massachusetts. Um, uh, in 2019, he became an inductee in the Springfield School uh, Sports Hall of Fame. Mm. So he used to ball on them. Uh, <laughs> he happens also to be, and I won't say this with, uh, uh, I won't say this begrudgingly, he, he happens to be a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, and thank you for coming to help us. And next we have Councilwoman Tracy Whitfield. Uh, Tracy is an active, involved, and vocal Springfield City Councilor at large. All right, she was elected as the first African-American woman vice president of the Springfield City Council in 2021. Um, and she is also a proud member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Let's see, are we, do we have Marcus? Is Dr. Marcus Ware, with, there he is, there he is. Dr. Marcus Ware is an accomplished educational leader, uh, bringing over a decade of experience in transforming K through 12 uh, public education. Uh, he works particularly on schools to drive academic excellence and to foster inclusive learning environments. Uh, as an educator, I thank you, brother, for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Now, before I call these young men uh, dignitaries, I want you to look across the aisle and see who you could be one day. This is so important. This is so important. So today, this is what it looks like. Uh, we will have the, the young men, each will have uh, uh, opportunity to speak. They will have five, a uh, minimum of five minutes to speak, a maximum of seven minutes uh, to speak. They will be judged uh, uh, by the originality, content, and execution of their uh, speeches. Uh, the judges, uh, there are seven, will be doing the work. Uh, there will be somebody up in front to signal to you when time is up, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. But I'd be remiss if I didn't explain where this comes from, where this, uh, uh, this special event comes from. It comes from uh, somebody who's near and dear to the, to the hearts of people in Massachusetts, that's Senator Edward W. Brooke III, uh, who is a, a personal hero. Uh, Senator Brooke uh, attended Howard University and went to Boston University for uh, his law degree. Uh, he was an officer in the US Army uh, he came back and became the first African-American uh, attorney general uh, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, uh, as we know, he became the first elected uh, African-American U.S. senator. This is such a big deal. Uh, if, if you don't know, ask your grandparents about it. Ask your parents about it. Um, of course he was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. That doesn't... That doesn't require. It goes without being yeah, said. Yeah, that doesn't. Thank you. <laughs> that doesn't require anything. But uh, most recently, uh, a state senate, uh, well, a state courthouse in Massachusetts was named after him, uh, and he received. And this is so important: uh, a medal, a president, uh, a congressional gold medal from Pre uh, President Barack Obama, um, two days after his 90th birthday. And this is this is no small affair. You all are in the legacy 
of Senator Brooke. And so we look forward to, to hearing from you. And so uh, we'll begin uh, by introducing the very first uh, to come. Uh, this young man, his name is Zarek Alicia, uh, and he's from Discovery Polytech, early college high school. He is a sophomore there. Uh, his hobbies include uh, volleyball, robotics, tutoring. He is uh, something like Jewel George Biddle Kelly, uh, who, who thought of creating bridges and that sort of thing. He has a, a quote that's near and dear to his heart. He says, I never, I never lose. Either I win or I learn. And he gets that from Nelson Mandela. Um, looking forward in life, he's going to be a computer hardware engineer. Uh, and his parent, uh, I don't know if uh, your parent is in the house, but if your parent is in the house, would Anna Caballero stand up? Yeah. <laughs> And his mentor is uh, Christoph Zeffrin. And so please, uh, to the microphone. Yes. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, as we gather here today, we are confronted with a critical question that resonates deeply within the fabric of our society. How have the decisions of the Supreme Court impacted the communities of color over the past decade? This question is not merely an inquiry. It is a call to examine the soul of our nation and confront the realities faced by those who have been historically oppressed. My name is Derek Alicea. I am a student at Discovery High School. I am obsessed with the thrill of success, constantly seeking new ways to transcend. Whether it being academically, athletically, or socially, I am always searching for new ways to improve. My relentless pursuit of excellence is tribute to my mom's influence, and I aim to show her that I can make both of our dreams come true. I come from a Hispanic background, Puerto Rico to be exact. However, I was born here in America. Honestly, this has been troubling. I was not in contact with my family for most of my life due to this, and this made me feel lost and confused about things in my heritage. However, this interconnectedness plays a key role in my cultural lens of the world. I've been able to see both sides of scrutiny and <laughs> witness the firsthand, witness firsthand the nuanced complexities of navigating identity and the profound impact of judicial decisions on marginalized communities like mine. For example, the Supreme Court has made very questionable decisions about Puerto Rico's existence as a territory. Biggest example being United States versus Valle Madero recently in 2022, where the Supreme Court ruled against Valle Madero in an 8-1 decision, stating that the Congress has the authority to exclude Puerto Rico residents from SSI benefits. SSI, or Supplemental Security Income Benefits, are federal payments provided to elderly, blind, or disabled individuals with limited income and resources to help meet basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter. The court held that the exclusion was constitutional, emphasizing Congress's broad powers to make decisions about federal benefits and territories. Over the past decade, the Supreme Court has played a pivotal role in shaping the legal landscape of our country. Its decisions carry profound consequences for our communities of color. While some rulings have advanced the cause of justice and equality, others have regrettably perpetuated systemic injustices and widened the gap of inequality. Positively, however, in recent years, landmark decisions such as those affirming marriage equality and upholding the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA program, have been celebrated as victories for equality and inclusion. Since June 15, 2012, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, is a lifeline for certain undocumented immigrants who entered the country as minors. By obtaining a work permit, a social security number, and driver's license through this strategy, they can avoid deportation and live and work in the United States in an open, open and lawful manner. Every DACA approval has a two-year expiration date and is renewable, offering continuous protection and job prospects. These rulings have provided hope and validation for countless individuals within our communities of color, affirming their inherent dignity and right to equality under the law. 
However, we cannot ignore the stark realities of the decisions that undermine the very foundation of our democracy. The gutting of key provisions of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County v. Holder has facilitated voter rights suppression efforts that disproportionately disenfranchise our communities of color. 2013 saw the Supreme Court decision Shelby, Shelby County v. Holder, which addressed the validity of two significant sections of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The case focused on Section 5 of the Act, which mandated that before making any changes to their voting laws or procedures, some states and local governments with a history of racial discrimination had to obtain consent or pre-clearance from the federal government. By a vote of 5-4, the court struck down the action Section 4B coverage formula, so making Section 5 unusable until Congress could create a new coverage formula. The court's failure to adequately address systemic racial disparities within our, culture, within our criminal justice system perpetuates cycles of incarceration and injustice that disproportionately impact communities of color. Furthermore, let us examine Brenovich v. Democratic National Committee. It is a significant Supreme Court case that examined Arizona's voting regulations and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The court upheld Arizona's laws including restrictions on ballot collection and out-of-precinct voting, ruling that they did not violate the Voting Rights Act or discriminate against minorities. The 2021 decision had implications for voting rights and the interpretation of the Voting Rights Act across the United States. This decision undermines the hard-fought progress towards a more equitable and inclusive democracy, relegating marginalized voices to the sidelines of our political process. As we reflect on the past decade, we must recognize that the Supreme Court is not immune to the biases and prejudices that pervade our society. Its decisions have real and tangible consequences for the lives of millions of people, particularly those from marginalized communities who have historically been denied justice and equality. But in the face of adversity, we must not lose hope. You must advocate for a judiciary that reflects the diversity of our nation and upholds the principles of justice, equality, and fairness for all. We must demand accountability from our elected leaders and strive to dismantle the systemic barriers that perpetuate racial injustice within our legal system. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Let us stand united in the fight for a more just and equitable future where the decisions of the Supreme Court serve as beacons of hope rather than instruments of oppression. Together, you and I can build a society where all are truly equal under the eyes of the law. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, can we uh, give them a round of applause one more time? Great job, man. So, who's next up? Uh, and uh, Senator Gomez, you may want to look out for your position. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, up next, we have Avery Coburn, uh, son of uh, one of my former teachers at uh, Renaissance. Good to see you. Um, Avery, he is a Minichog High School student, 10th uh, grade sophomore. Uh, he has hobbies that include soccer, volleyball, as well as computers. Now, he, as far as his future aspirations, uh, he's still deciding on the imprint that he wants to leave on this world. But uh, just thinking about his, his verbiage and saying his imprint says enough to me that anything he decides to do will be uh, very impactful. Um, he loves psychology and thinking about how people interact with one another and how human behavior is guided and controlled by various factors outside of our control. Um, his parents, again, Leslie and Aria Coburn, and uh, his mentor for this competition has been James Lightfoot, uh, who has been a great mentor, uh, and I can speak to that personally. So I look forward to hearing you go, and uh, come on up.
Over the, last over the last decade, the Supreme Court has made many pivotal decisions that have impacted and affected the lives of millions, particularly the community of color. From landmark rulings that promise equality to contentious decisions that widen the divide, the Supreme Court's influence is undeniable and far-reaching. In the past decade, Supreme Court decisions have both helped and hindered communities of color and emphasized the complexity of judiciary roles in the pursuit of civil rights and equality. The Supreme Court's rulings have had an often negative impact on communities of color, especially concerning voting rights. One particular instance is the Shelby v. Holder case in 2013, where the court invalidated parts of Voting Rights Act of 1965. This decision removed supervision of voting laws, cha law changes in states with histories of discrimination. As a result, there was an increase in voting laws like demanding voter IDs and reducing voting, which disproportionately affects Backs voters of color, another important case. Another important case, Rucho v. Common Cause in 2019 stated that federal courts couldn't address gerrymandering, allowing states to redraw districts that could weaken minority communities' voting power. These rulings, along with Brinovich v. Democratic National Committee in 2021, which supported voting restrictions in Arizona, revealed a pattern of weakening safeguards that guarantee equal access to voting rights. This decline not only influences elections, results but also weakens marginalized communities, political impact, and future opportunities. In recent years, a significant Supreme Court ruling that impacted communities of color was Shelby v. County Holder case in 2013. This decision struck down sections of Voting Rights Acts of 1965 which played a role in safeguarding minority voters from unfair practices by eliminating the need for states with histories of voter discrimination to seek federal approval before making changes to voting laws. The rulings triggered an increase in vote, new voter identification requirements and redistricting strategies. These alterations have had an impact on American and Latino voters, making it more challenging for them to exercise their voting rights. This, uh, this case illustrates how decisions made by the Supreme Court can at times hinder progress and worsen existing disparities, underscoring the fight for rights and emphasizing the necessity of judicial supervision. In safeguarding marginalized communities, they have underscored the significance of staying alert and protecting voting rights, prompting a rise in advocacy and efforts legislative measures to secure voting processes. By adhering to fairness and equality principles, the Supreme Court has advanced in tackling the challenges faced by minority groups and defending their rights within established frameworks. By adhering to fairness and equality principles, the Supreme Court has advanced in tackling the challenges faced by minority groups and defending their rights with established frameworks. This decision made by the Supreme Court in, in the case Rucho v. Common Cause in 2019 has significantly damaged the voting rights of minority communities. By standing that Stating that federal courts should not interfere in cases of gerrymandering, the court has essentially approved the manipulation of voting districts to suppress communities of color. This harmful practice weakens the voting power of minorities by in either concentrating them in districts of dispersing or dispersing them across areas leading to their votes being marginalized. This not only denies minority voters representation, but also perpetuates systemic inequalities that impede their ability to advocate for essential policies and reforms. The consequences of this go beyond elections. Future generations will face a system stacked against them, encountering obstacles in achieving political fairness and justice. The system, the Supreme Court's decision in Rucho v. Common Cause is a setback for voters from diverse backgrounds. It establishes a worrying precedent that this jeopardizes our democratic foundation. If we allow these practices to persist unchecked, our system's integrity will deteriorate more, marginalizing people from diverse backgrounds and eroding public confidence in democratic institutions. In 2021, the court's decision in Brinovich v. Democratic National Committee upheld restrictive voting laws in Arizona. These laws, including requirements for voters to cast their ballots in their assigned precincts and limitations on ballot collections by third parties were upheld despite evidence indicating that disproportionate impact on Native American, Latino, and African American voters. Such measures coupled with other voting restrictions like strict voter ID laws and reduced early voting periods pre present significant obstacles for people of color to exercise their right to vote. 
This suppression of minority voter turnout not only undermines the political representation of these communities, but also has long-term consequences, including diminished efforts to address racial inequality, access to education, and economic opportunities. By affirming these restrictive voting laws, the Supreme Court's decision in Brinovich v. Democratic National Committee shapes the future of future trajectory of minority communities potentially perpetuating cycles of disenfranchisement and inequality. In examining the impact of court decisions on the rights of marginalized communities over the past decade, it becomes evident that the rulings in Shelby County v. Holder, Rucho v. Common Cause, and Brinovich v. Democratic National Committee have shaped the landscape of voting rights. These cases underscore a troubling trend of eroding protections for minority voters, resulting in a dilution of their political voice. As we reflect on these developments, it becomes imperative to confront the broader implication for the future of dem the democracy and advocate for measures that ensure equability, access to the ballot box for all citizens, regardless of race or ethnicity. The Supreme Court is a system that's supposed to uphold the law, but instead undermines communities of color. A system that contradicts itself will eat itself alive with me first at the chopping block. One more round of applause, please. Good job, Avery. Outstanding, outstanding work. And again, uh, Brother Fitch, uh, it looks like Avery will be looking for an internship this summer, and so we'll be counting on you. Uh, it's very, very important to recognize that these young men uh, uh, took a good deal of time preparing for these, these speeches. And so uh, we're, again, I can't say it enough, proud of these young men. Uh, and it's nerve and anxiety inducing to stand up in front of these beautiful people. So another just slight round of applause for everybody. Yeah. I'd like to introduce uh, next uh, somebody that uh, when I was reading his bio reminded me of uh, the, the dear Alpha Phi Alpha brother Donnie Hathaway. I don't suspect that you young men would know who Donnie Hathaway is, but some of your parents and you might be here because of Donnie Hathaway. <laughs> this young man, Andrew Wilson, is a senior at Springfield Honors Academy. Uh, he's a writer, he's a, a, a poet, a, a volleyball player, uh, and, and, and as I alluded to before, a songwriter. Uh, he intends to be a journalist. Uh, in my mind, uh, this is the kind of, of, of young person we need right now to explain what's happening in the world. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of songwriters that are evading the issues. And, uh, and so we're counting on young brother Wilson to tell us uh, what's right. Uh, and so he uh, has a parent here today, uh, Sonia Wilson, if you're in the building, please, a round of applause. Yes, round of applause. And his mentor happens to be uh, a mentor that I had back in Columbia, Missouri, uh, a brother by the name of Henry McMillan. I called him Petey way back then. Uh, and he was hard on us, let me just say. Uh, and so I know that you are ready to rock and roll, young brother Wilson, and please, to the podium. Thank you. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Originally, I had began researching with the belief that the Supreme Court was failing communities of color. The media is always telling us that they're working against communities of color, which is an inaccurate statement. Although, when I was researching, I had found that most cases ruled in favor of the minority. And of course, they can't be given praise for correcting wrongs that should have never been committed in the first place, but we should recognize how much raising awareness has done for ourselves. Under the administration of President Trump, he established the Migrant, Pro Migrant Protection Protocol. That program provided 
for the return of Mexico to not, for the return of Mexico of non-Mexican citizens who have been detained while attempting to enter the United States illegally from Mexico. These protocols cause undocumented citizens to stay in Mexico while their claim was being processed. That way the pressure of the United States immigration system was alleviated. On inauguration day 2021, the new administration of President Biden announced that the program would be suspended the next day. The district court and the Court of Appeals, however, held that doing so would violate the Immigration and Nationality Act, concluding that the return policy was mandatory so long as illegal entrants were being released into the United States. However, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Biden, which led to the termination of MPP. This would make keeping undocumented citizens out of the country unlawful. Although the United States still tries to ban citizens unlawfully, even the ones who are documented, on January 8th, 2024, Jonas Fierk had argued that when making a business trip to Sudan in 2009, he could not return because FBI agents had placed him on the no-fly list. Reasons related to his race, national origin, and religious beliefs. The agents questioned him extensively about the Portland mosque he attended when he was home, but that reason alone is not good enough to put him on the no-fly list. Not being able to return to the United States made it very difficult for Fierk to file a suit, which is what they wanted. The Supreme Court did rule in favor of Fierk which in retrospect, yeah, we freak. In retrospect, it appears when the government can't keep citizens out of the United States, they find a way to control them inside of the United States. Another example of government intervention is Isleta de Su Pueblo v. Texas. Oddly of all things, it seemed bingo. Texas, it seems, is worried about allowing tribal games about gambling would have a detrimental effect on existing charitable bingo operations in the state of Texas, as stated in Isleta de Su Pueblo v. Texas. Isleta de Su Pueblo is an indigenous tribe which has sovereign immunity and authority under agreement. This means that dictating which games will be played on their tribal land would be unconstitu unconstitutional. This, with that being said, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the tribe. Unfortunately, the government is not only opposing on land, but also our rights. According to the case of Uzbugman B. Peretsky, Sheikh Uzbugman was exercising his freedom of speech and religious practice on college campus when a campus officer prohibited him from doing so in an undesignated area. 20 minutes after, Uzbugman began speaking on the day, allowed by his permit, another campus officer again told him to stop. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Uzbugman due to his freedom of speech. We should be grateful for how much the Supreme Court has changed. After all, how can we expect our own government to protect regular citizens when they won't even protect those who serve? Pursuant to that authority, Congress enacted a federal law that gives returning vet veterans the right to reclaim their prior jobs with their state employers and authorize a suit if those employers refuse to accommodate them. See Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act of 1994. But that wasn't the case for Leroy Torres. Leroy Torres asked his former employer, responded Texas of responded Texas Department of Public Safety to accommodate his condition by reemploying him in a different role. Texas refused to do so. Due to the federal law set in place, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Torres. Some people may hear all this and think the Supreme Court is doing the bare minimum for communities of color. Before we look into our final case, let's, ask, let's take these questions into consideration. How much proper education is given to communities of color? How often is mental health recognized in communities of color? How well do communities of color know their rights? As stated in Zulu Ruhan v. Texas, it is a case where two doctors were nearly charged with distributing unprescribed and unauthorized substances. The case, the Supreme Court ruled that the individual must have a degree of knowledge necessary to make the person criminally responsible for his or her acts. Both doctors were of color, and even though they might be doctors, this policy was used to protect, this, pro this policy can be used to protect communities of color who may not have access to that, may not have access to make it necessary to understand their rights. As people of color, we are victims in America every day, constantly wrong, constantly weakened, and constantly work against. But if there's anything we do best, and it's what we've been doing for years, for, for decades, for centuries, is fighting for our rights. Over the years, we have seen a lot more advocacy for these rights, and more people ask when is there gonna be a change? This is the change. This is what we are fighting for. All citizens in these cases may not be winners, but they did not walk away losers. Therefore, the Supreme Court will continue to impact communities of color positively as long as communities of color keep advocating for their rights before the Supreme Court. Thank you. Great job, great job. One more round of applause, please. So, next up, we have 
Oh, wait, we have. All right. <laughs> Next up, we have Michael C. Jones. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, sure, clap. Sure. Go ahead, clap. Uh, we see that Michael has a great support system so far. Um, Michael is a uh, Springfield International Charter School senior. Um, his future aspirations include graduating from Roger Williams University um, and above all to become an agent of change, positive change. Um, it takes a village to raise a child is his favorite quote that's listed here. One that I truly believe in myself. Uh, it's been a reoccurring theme in my life and so uh, for him to have that it definitely resonates with me. Uh, I'm sure with many of you as well. Um, he's brought here by his parents. Uh, hopefully uh, we got Vanetta as well as Michael Sr. here in the crowd. Hey. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. And we've got the rest of his family, siblings, I assume. All right, awesome. Um, his mentor, Denzel Washington. Uh, I know Denzel's uh, super invested in this, uh, this competition. Um, and so I, I assume that uh, Michael is well prepared that he's, he's uh, been through the ringer with Denzel. Um, no pressure. No pressure. No pressure at all. Um, would you like to add anything? Oh, uh, Michael Jones, uh, when reading his biography, didn't he remind you of uh, our dear Jewel, uh, Eugene Kinkle Jones, his idea of wanting to, to, to help the world? Uh, Eugene Kinkle Jones, of course, being uh, the first uh, National Executive Secretary of the Urban League, uh, and the Urban League being a, a sponsor of this event. So it really made me think of, of, of Michael Jones. And so we're looking forward to what you're able to do, but it's gonna start up at this microphone. So come on up, Michael Jones. Good evening, everyone. The Supreme Court, as the highest judicial authority in the United States, plays a crucial role in shaping policies, legal precedents that affect every aspect of our lives. The justices of the Supreme Court make their decisions based on a document written 237 years ago. For those of you who may not know what document I am referencing, it is the Constitution. Although it is said to be written for we the people, the we only included white landowning men. Today, we are still governed by this document. This means that the Supreme Court's decisions often have disproportionately significant implications for marginalized groups of people, particularly women of color. Studies done by the National Institutes of Health provide evidence showing that women of color, particularly black women, were four times more likely to experience maternal mortality than white women. One of the most contentious areas where the Supreme Court's rulings have affected communities of color is reproductive rights. In 2016, the Supreme Court decided that in Home Women's Health v. Hellerstead that Texas's restrictive abortion laws place an undue burden on women seeking abortions. This decision was crucial because it protected access to abortion services, which are vital uh, which are vital for women of color who are facing greater barriers to healthcare. These barriers include healthcare disparity due to location, discrimination, health literacy, and much more. However, the 2022 decision in Dobbs v. Jackson's Women's Health Organization, which overturned Roe v. Wade, shifted the, the somewhat healthcare opportunity landscape that this image painted. This ruling has led to implementations of numerous state level restrictions on abortions. Women of color who already experience higher rates of maternal mortality and limited access to healthcare are now facing even more significant obstacles in accessing reproductive healthcare. The overturning of Roe v. Wade exacerbates existing disparities. This decision not only affects their health, but also their socioeconomic mobility and overall well being. The ripple effects include increased financial strain as these women may need to travel long distances to access abortion services, greater health risk due to potential delays and or resorting to unsafe methods. In Shelby County v. Holder, the court invalidated key provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which had protected minority voters from discriminatory practices. 
This decision paved the way for numerous states to implement voter ID laws and other measures that disproportionately disenfranchise communities of color. Following this, the 2019 case of Rucho v. Common case ruled that federal courts could not intervene in cases of partisan gerrymandering. Gerrymandering often dilutes the voting power of minority communities, making it harder for these people to have their voices heard and elect representatives who reflect their needs and concerns. I want everyone in this room to stand up. Look to your left and look to your right. Notice all the women around you. Now I want all the women to please have a seat. I want all the men to imagine a world without these women. Imagine a world without Michelle Obama working to better public health and nutrition. Imagine a world without Simone Biles breaking, breaking records and simultaneously advocating for the connection between mental health and physical health. Imagine a world without Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson fighting in a world, fighting in a room where eight others may not always have our best interest at heart. You may now have a seat. While these women are advocating for themselves, it is our duty as men who need these women to advocate with and for them. We must take the initiative to educate ourselves on the discrepancies our mothers, sisters, and daughters are facing. We must mobilize our communities and take action with what the newfound knowledge we have entails. And we must create change. For if not for you, do it for her. I call on you to do something our Supreme Court does not, and it starts with us. These decisions directly impact communities of color through our women. Without women of color, there are no men of color. Without men of color, there is no Alpha Phi Alpha Incorporated. Without women of color, there are no communities of color. As we reflect on how Supreme Court decisions in the past decade have impacted, our, have impacted communities of color, it becomes clear that we, as members of these direct injustices, cannot remain passive observers. Thank you. Whoa. Love that one. Great job, great job. One more round of applause, please. Look, I'm, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it every single time. <laughs> well, I'm, I feel so bad uh, for the judges uh, who have to <laughs> deliberate on the, the, the very good content that's being delivered here today. Uh, I most especially want uh, Councilwoman Whitfield and, and, uh, and Sister, uh, Sister Jones to uh, keep track of young Mr. Jones. Uh, somebody like that uh, is, is, is important. So. I want a job too, look. <laughs> Outstanding, thank you for your service and that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. Thank you so much. Uh, up next, uh, I'm very excited about this one um, and several of us in here are very excited, uh, is Joey Sanchez, Joey Sanchez. Joey Sanchez uh, attends Discovery Early College High School uh, where he is a junior. Uh, now, his hobbies include uh, football, uh, reading, biking, uh, sparring, uh, I guess he's a pugilist, uh, and learning from experience. And when sparring, you learn from experience, I can assure you. I can assure you. Uh, when I was thinking about him, I was thinking about our dear fraternity brothers, All-Americans, Fritz Pollard. Uh, who had finished at Brown University back in the teens, the 19 teens. And then also uh, Levi Jackson from the New England area, uh, who was at Yale, the first uh, captain of, a, of a, a varsity team at Yale University. Uh, they too were athletes uh, and scholars like Joey Sanchez. Joey Sanchez, uh, he says his future aspirations are to, to live a life to my fullest where I I may uh, find content uh, where I may be content in my life. Uh, his favorite quotation is, yesterday was history, tomorrow is a mystery. 
but today is a gift. That is why we. That is why it's called the present. Uh, present. That was very good. It was very good. Uh, his mentor. Uh, his mentor is uh, uh, a dear new fraternity brother uh, by the name of David Halbert. And so, uh, so we're very thankful to have you, Mr. Sanchez, please, to the podium. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon. My name, my name is Joey Sanchez. Today I want to discuss the Supreme Court case, the Department of Homeland Security, the Regents of the University of California, which focus on the potential elimination of the uh, DACA program, which is short for Deferred, Ch <laughs> Deferred Action for Childhood uh, Arrivals. <clears throat> that protects residents who were brought to the U.S. as children from being deported and also provides them a uh, chance to secure a legal work document, uh, legal work documents. The 2020 decision in the case that was the challenge to the program was invalid. Well, the decision, um, <clears throat> the justices that were supportive of keeping the program were Chief Justice John Robert, Roberts, Justice Ruth Batter uh, Ginsburg, Justice Stephen Breyer, um, just <clears throat> Justice Sonia Sotomayor, and Justice Elena Kagan. The justices that opposed the DACA program were Justice Neil Gorsuch, Justice Neil uh, Brett Kavanaugh, Justice Clarence Thomas, and Justice Samuel Alito. Justices Alito, Gorsuch, and Thomas wrote a dissenting opinion, with Justice Brett Kavanaugh writing a separate dis uh, dissenting opinion. <clears throat> The policy issue that was being brought to the court was the fate of the DACA program, which was originally implemented by the uh, Obama administration in 2012. The Trump administration saw the DACA implementation un, um, as unlawful. <coughs> Polling at the time showed that there were about 78% of people who wanted those under the DACA program to stay and get legal citizenship. 60% were in favor of the DACA program generally. Generally, 12% desired those under the DACA program to be deported, and finally, 21% who simply were against the DACA program as a whole. The regents of the University of the California system opposed the idea of removing the DACA program. They believed it would have a negative impact on many, uh, on many num uh, people under the DACA program including a significant number of California students, prompting their, deci uh, their decision to challenge DHS. The possibility of what could happen if the DHS was overturned could cause overwhelming effects. Some impacts could have included families being distressed due to a family member being deported, and schools and hospitals being understaffed. Since employees and teachers under the DACA program could also be deported. <clears throat> According to immigrationimpacts.com, over 141,000 students were enrolled in the DACA program at the time of the case. If they were to be deported, it would have led to a high increase of students who wished to get an education but lost the opportunity. <clears throat> these, poten thank you. these potential deportations would not only affect families, but the viability of certain businesses due to their reliance on the immigrant workforce. Beyond students and workers, business, um, business owners subject to deportation would be forced to abandon their business, since they themselves could be deported. The effects of the Supreme Court's uh, decision in this case have reduced uncertainty in communities across the country, primarily communities of color. This ruling allowed people under the DACA program to keep their place of employment, business owners to keep what they have worked hard for, and for students to keep learning, growing, and thriving. I believe that potentially deporting thousands of people who had no choice in coming into the United States and who are positively impacting our communities is something that is unfair, not only to those being deported, but to those in their lives as well. Many dreamers have spent their lives building businesses and giving back to their communities and local economies. Removal of the DACA program 
would have invalidated all of the time, the effort, and resources they spent, um, they spent years committing trying to achieve the American dream without any compensation whatsoever for their losses. I believe that the majority opinion in the case and the decision not to eliminate the DACA program was correct. No one should have to lose so much after working so hard to get where they, are, uh, where they were. The Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA program, was a critical support for many young people across the country. <clears throat> the attack on it by the, department, uh, the Trump Department of Homeland Security would have been devastating to not just these young people, but their families and communities as well. The impacts of eliminating the program would have had serious consequences beyond dreamers, those in their immediate vicinity, with particular effe uh, effects on the businesses, communities, and consumers. <clears throat> By upholding the DACA program, the Supreme Court helped create a more stable pathway to a brighter and more productive future for thousands of people across the country, primarily young people of color in, the w in this way, the Supreme Court helped society take an important step towards true liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Excellent job, great job. One more round of applause, final round of applause for our contestants. Good job. I, this is such a special okay. moment, uh, and we appreciate you all being here and listening and being so attentive to these young men who did an outstanding job. You could tell in the preparation, the court cases that they kept track of, the dates, the people that they mentioned, uh, it was outstanding from top to bottom. I do not envy the judges. Uh, in this particular, with regard to Joy, I hope that uh, Brother Page and Dr. Ware and, and, uh, and Brother uh, Gonzalez, uh, I hope you're keeping track of young Joey. Uh, this is the kind of person we need in the area, uh, and we need to, to, to wrap our arms around somebody like young Joey. And so um, this is a time where we'll give the judges uh, a little space to, to make their deliberations. Uh, but at this moment, we'd like to, uh, if possible, uh, turn to the Brotherhood for the goodwill collection and uh, discussion about tax, uh, tax deductible contributions. And so uh, coming forth, ooh, this is, this is always my favorite part. He's got the baskets, yes. Yes, always, uh, is Brother Lee and I see President Asafripi there, I see. Okay, and so they will take a little time for, for us. Did you want to have a word, Brother Lee? <laughs> Amen. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for your support this afternoon. Uh, at this time, as we do in the Baptist church, it's, it's time for offering. <laughs> but as you can see, uh, by seeing these young men this afternoon, that this is where we put your donations and your contributions. Um, we put it back into our community, and we try to mentor and offer support um, within our community. So please, we ask that you uh, donate from your heart, donate from um, the best that you can, uh, but this is how we do community service as a fraternity, as well as all the other fraternities in this community as well. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Washington. Thank you, Brother Lee, for that. There was an evil, evil rumor that went around in the 1980s and 1990s that there were, there were no black role models, no black male role models. Uh, we came here today. Theta Iota Lambda showed up today to explain to you that that was a lie, that that was a lie. Here you have the finest men in the community uh, taking their time to work with uh, the young people, to work on their speeches, to work on their, uh, their endeavors in school. Uh, and so we really appreciate the work 
of these, uh, these men of Theta Iota Lambda. Uh, everybody's making me look bad, reaching in their pocket. Let me reach in my pocket. Got to lead by example. That's what they say. Who, uh, that's what they say. Let me see if we got anything. All right. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Yeah. And so it's important that we remember this, that we remember this, that, that uh, I was told when I was young, and I was talking to Brother Austin about this, is uh, we love money. But the old people used to say, Brother Page, the old people used to say that time spends better than money. And the men of Theta Iota Lambda have given their time to these young people and to the community. And for that, I'm, I'm forever grateful. Uh, young people like Brother Austin, Austin uh, has been doing the work from top to bottom. So the oratorical contest is just one of the things that they work on. They work on health initiatives. Yeah. Work on health initiatives. They work on uh, other things with educational activities. Uh, Denzel Washington regularly is involved in a tutoring program of young people and a reading literacy program as well. This is important for us. It's near and dear to our hearts. It's near and dear to the foundings of the fraternity uh, itself. And so we're thankful that you get to witness this and be a part of this uh, today. And so uh, yeah, ahead, I'd just like to add, you know, I was a benefactor of, you know, this community. Um, I know Brother Joe from a long time ago, a lot of familiar faces from my childhood when I was these young gentlemen's age. Um, you know, huge benefactor of the fraternity itself prior to becoming a member myself. So, you know, understand that, again, the time that we put in um, truly is, you know, uh, not with waste. You know, and I can be ex an exact example of that. And so, again, forever grateful for everyone who's come to support. Um, and we appreciate you all for being here and contributing to the goodwill basket that's been going around as well. Absolutely. And the judges as well. Thank you all for coming. That's so kind of thank you. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes people don't get their flowers, uh, but I'd like to give uh, the flowers to, to, to the co MC who is uh, finishing up his master's degree, and that's no small affair. We're getting there. Affair. We're getting there. That's no small affair. Thank you, thank you. And so lift him up uh, on his way. Uh, and so I'd like to, at this moment, call to the stage, if possible, uh, our uh, Theta Iota Lambda's director of education. That would be, oh, no? Yes, <laughs> Brother Denzel Washington. We hope that he would bring his crutch with him <laughs> as he comes. Uh, but also, uh, the president of the Libby Revels Scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> Tupac Shakur, Tupac Am Amaru Shakur. Uh, but the, the Lee B. Revels uh, Scholarship and Mentoring Foundation president, uh, somebody who is a good brother, as the old people used to say, a good brother, uh, Brother James uh, Lightfoot III. Uh, he will be, a, they will all be accompanied uh, by our, our fearless president, uh, Brother President Jason Asarifi. And so uh, to the podium, gentlemen, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm excited, I'm elated to see you all here today. Uh, thank you to our co-MCs. Uh, love these brothers, Brother Bradley and Brother Austin. Yes. This, this right here, what you're witnessing is our brotherhood, right? Um, I met Henry, I wanna say 13 years ago. Yeah. And, we stayed friends ever since, and in a moment of need, we give him a call, and he's there. I met Brother Bradley more recently, and I can't pinpoint the moment I met him, but it feels like he's always been there. So once again, brothers, we thank you. 
I want to thank the contestants for showing up. It, it's easy to make excuses. Excuses are tools that can be used, but you guys showed up here today. And for that, each and every one of the people in this room is grateful because you guys are a future, and seeing you guys here today means our future is in great hands. So for that, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the parents because these kids would not be able to be here without you guys. You guys put in the time. You guys, I'm sure, making sure they're getting up and writing their speeches, getting to school, and showing up to the commitment. But most importantly, you guys are setting examples for them to lead. So a round of applause for yourselves as parents. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to thank all the sponsors, benefactors, the brothers of the chapters, the judges who showed up on a Saturday where they could be doing many, many other things. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for continuing to support this program. And as long as the chapter is around, we will continue to put on this program for our community, for our people, and for our kids. So once again, thank you. What more can I say? I won't say it anyway. <laughs> all right. Uh, first of all, James Lightfoot, I am the president of the Levy Revel Scholarship and Mentoring Foundation. Uh, I'm honored that these brothers entrust me uh, the leadership of the foundation um, as we support all of our educational activities. Uh, thank you to the young men, as uh, Brother Asarifi said, for showing up. I think I said that in one of our first workshops, or probably most recently, that that's the hardest part, right? Walking up to the start line. Now you've crossed it, and you are all very successful uh, in completing this journey. So kudos to you. Thank you all again for joining us uh, for this program. Uh, the Edward W. Brook III Oratorical Competition uh, is one of the parts of our national program entitled Go to High School, Go to College, uh, where we work and mentor young men, uh, work with young men uh, to get them to that post-secondary uh, opportunity, whether it be uh, into college, right? It says go to high school, go to college, right? Help them to enter into work into the workforce, and help prepare them for life. This uh, is our thirteenth oratorical cont contest, uh, and we would like to give a big thank you to the Greater Springfield community uh, for their endless support over the years. Without you, we would not be able to keep this going. I would like to give a very special thank you to our sponsors, Springfield College, Prudential Insurance, Bay State Health Systems, and the Urban League of Springfield. And our countless, <laughs> I was in our countless community sponsors, some of which uh, chose to remain anonymous, but within your program, you'll see them listed uh, on our back page. On this day, programs like this are most important, providing young people the platform to speak on subjects that matter and hopes to bring about change in our world. We know how much we need change. In this world, we need to continue to empower young men and women and provide them the opportunity to engage with model citizens, engage in programs that help build the capacity, their capacity to achieve their goals, and the knowledge and skills to engage gauge their rights in voting and engaging in movements for better civil rights. We thank you as you have continued to support the Levy Rebel Scholarship and Mentoring Foundation. We look forward to your support for the 14th, 14th rendition of this event, uh, and we will see you in 2025. Please look out for other opportunities to engage with these young men, as well as this organization uh, throughout the year. And now, we will have our results. Doom, doom, doom. Feels like the Oscars. All right. And so this is where it always gets interesting. So I want all the winners to come join me in the front. All of you, right here.
Thank you. Take your moment. This is all for you. Everyone came out to see you today, not me. All right, can we give them another round of applause, a real one? All right, so each contestant today, you may see, be seated, uh, will be gifted uh, a medallion for their participation in this contest. They will receive a gift bag full of goodies um, coming from many of our sponsors. And our winners, the top three that have been selected by our judges, the seven who sit before us. So any complaints, please see the office of, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> No, so they've been selected by uh, our panel of judges that we thank so much. Um, we'll receive a trophy for first, second, and third place. Um, as well, those top three will, see, will receive uh, a scholarship award um, to be presented to them um, at the time of admission uh, to their post-secondary journey, whether that be college or trade school or any program that helps them to advance in their academic journey. With that, look, my heart is beating. I can take all the time I need. Folds. Oh, and they get a, a certificate of participation. Okay. We'll keep it going. You want to hand those out? Yeah. Right. Cool. Th their hands are full. <laughs> Avery Coburn. <laughs> Zarek. Andrew. Michael. Your hands are full, so you don't need the trophy. Thank you all. No. <laughs> Our first place with a score. Well, should we start from third? We'll start with third. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. They, that's why they don't invite me to award shows. <laughs> that's right. We're, te we're teaching them. We gotta, gotta build the climate. <laughs> third place with a score of 400 and 92 points, Andrew Wilson. <laughs> I don't want people to jump over here on me. Let me move away. I don't remember. With second place, 602 points. Zarek Alicia, did I say that right? <laughs> Correct me. In first place, with 700 points, James Light, I'm um, all right. First place, 631 points, Mr. Michael C. Jones. Now, can we give them all another round of applause? 